right, as we're turning to Proverbs 29, if we can, while we're saying good day to everybody. How good are those testimonies today in the chorus time? We're going to enter into our communion time shortly. Um, if you're visiting here today, you've already heard some really good stories about people's lives. Testimonies, we call them. They're true, they're factual, and you can talk to them. As Jane herself said, she's got a lot more detail than some of her um, brief that she mentioned here today. As also with Merv. If there's anything we can do to um, get you through to the baptism tank, um, we want to be there for, to, to help you. We don't want to be a stumbling block. We want to do all that we can to uh, get you through the door there. And back behind here, there's a baptism tank and there's change rooms behind here, male and female. Um, we'll give you a baptism card. We'll give you free coffee. There's a certificate you can get a free coffee afterwards or milk, milkshake. And there's more. We'll give you a Bible. Um, we can tell you about eternal life. You can receive the Holy Ghost. We don't give that out. That's God's department. But anything that we can do to help you get right with God today, we want to do that. Proverbs 29 says here in verse 18, where there is no vision... Uh, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Uh, which is always something we're aspiring to be happy in our life, in our marriage, in our relationship with God and as individuals. Um, so a vision, we can look at that at a psychological level where people talk about there's no vision, no understanding, no comprehension of what I'm going through. Um, you can be uh, spiritually talking in darkness. The Lord talks about having an understanding about a relationship with God, so where there's no vision, where there's no understanding about God's Bible, uh, his relationship with you, uh, understanding your promises that God can give you, when there is no vision, no understanding, um, when it talks about the word perish, it, the word perish doesn't necessarily mean to die, it just means you feel uncovered, you feel naked, you just feel a bit vulnerable when there's no vision. And you can be at um, anything we do. I mean, we went to Dakota Trail a few years ago and it's nice to have a, a vision, but part of that is that you, it's 96 kilometers, so you, you know the distance and then you start on your way and you need, a, you need psychological strength, you need mental strength, you need uh, spiritual strength and physical strength. That's what you need to get there. And all those things come into their own at different phases of that that walk that you're going through. There's things called false peaks where you're climbing up for a couple of hours and they're, and they're called false peaks and you think you're just getting to the top of a hill where you can have a break, I've made it to that hill and it's only it's a false peak then it goes that way, up higher. And then you've got to regroup, start walking, keep trekking, day at a time, and then where you sleep at night. So you've got to have a vision in the sense of a determination, uh, an aspiration to complete the journey when we first started from Kokoda to uh, from the Port Moresby into um, Popendetta, sort of south heading north. Uh, you go down a fairly long hill into the bottom of this hill, there's a river. And when we got to the bottom of this part here, that's the easy part, about the only time you go down, sort of thing, for the next few days. And there's people in the, in the river all relaxed and all kind of not talking. And we were going, oh, what's wrong with those grumpy people? They're not talking to us. And and we're, how you going, everybody? Really good. It's just only started out a couple of hours earlier. At the other end, we became them. You, you, you're exhausted, you're smashed, you don't feel like talking to anybody. And there's people coming that way. Oh, g'day, mate, how you going? I want to talk. We don't want to talk to you. We've just been walking for six days. So it's a hard gig, exciting, but there's a reward at the end of the satisfaction that you've actually done it. It's um, covering a, a track that is known as the Kokoda because of the... Uh, the famous Australian soldiers and the English were there as well and some Americans that uh, defended our nation against an invading army and that's, there's all that that goes with that so, so there's historical that goes with it but if you haven't got a vision to, f to finish the job then, um, then you, we perish, we just feel a bit uncovered and a bit, oh I don't know if I'm going to make it in our walk in the Lord we've got to have a vision that we want to make it into heaven. We want to be with God forever. That's our vision, that we, we want to live with the Lord forever. We want to make it to heaven because the alternative to go to hell 
ain't an option that we want to consider and all the people said and it's hard sometimes to com comprehend the whole plan of God eternal eternity why did he create us at the end of our life we're going to live forever I mean I can't comprehend forever as anybody else can I don't I don't comprehend living forever and ever and ever and ever I don't comprehend that fully but I do know that God said it'll be good we do know that we'll see Jesus Christ we do know that we'll see God in all his glory and the Bible says God is love and God is peace so whatever it is is going to be a land or a place of peace and harmony and goodness and it'll be a great place to be forever as opposed to the other way and then to comprehend that you, you don't just die and that's the end of it you know, actually are two choices it's either heaven or hell no pressure <laughs> take your choice today um, let's go to um, 1 Samuel in chapter 3 very quickly we'll have a look at where things went bad 1 Samuel without I'm talking reference to there, where, where there was no vision so verse 1 of chapter 3 Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli and the word of the Lord was precious in those days there was no open vision so they'd really lost their communication with God and it came to pass at the time when Eli was laid down to his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see so he's naturally lost his sight there's no spiritual vision and Ur the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was and Samuel was laid to sleep earlier in the Old Testament it says to use olive oil to keep the, the lamp of God in the tabernacle of God a light forever from evening until morning this would be the, the commitment that w the children of Israel gave is indicating that the light of God as we being a nation and God being our, our leader our ruler we're never going to let the light go out of God watching over our nation of God looking out for us we're God's people Israel ruling and reigning with God the word Israel means we're going to be Israel a nation in time but we're making some very fundamental promises here back in in Exodus and Leviticus where we're going to make sure in the ark of the covenant in the temple of God in the tabernacle that the lamp will never go out and here God's in darkness and it's a terrible place in this period of Israel's history and we can see further on that there was death Eli died he, uh, the, the nation was ta overtaken there was a lady that was about to have a baby she called the child Ichabod because the glory of God has departed from me and it was a very sad place to be in Israel at that time But because the word of God had darkened the people at the time let's go to Kings, Second Kings. So that was a bad bet. Second Kings in chapter twenty-two. We don't want to be like that, but maybe we have before we came to the Lord, where things just didn't work out in our life because the Word of God wasn't part of our life. In Second Kings, in chapter twenty-two, it says Josiah, King Josiah, was eight years old when he began to reign. He reigned thirty-one years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehida the daughter of Adiah of Boscoth. He did that which was right on the side of the Lord and walked all the way according to David his father and turned not aside to the right or to the left. And it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that Shaphan the son of Azariah and Meshalim, uh, the scribe in the house of the Lord, saying, God, tell Kai the priest that we may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord which the keepers of the door have gathered to the people and let them deliver it into the hands of the doers of the work that they have oversight of the house of the Lord and let them give it to the doers of the work which the house of the Lord to repair the breaches unto the house and carpenters and builders etc masons to build and to prepare the, repair the house and there was no reckoning with money because everything was dealt with faithfully so this is King Josiah, uh, King Josiah at the very young age wanting to get the house of God in order outwardly the building he's directing a bit of uh, activity to happen around the, the, this wonderful building at the time the, tab the building of God the house of God and there's money there there's everything for it to look really good and to be ready and people are, are kind of working in a good way 
And the bit that really hits home is Hilkiah, verse 8, the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. Shaphan the scribe came to the king and he brought the king the word again, saying, Thy servants have gathered the money that were found in the house. Is this a priority number one? Um, and have delivered them into the hand of them that do the work and that have over the other side of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Helkiah the priest has delivered me a book. Pretty casual. And the king and the Shaphan read it before the king, and it came to pass that when the king heard the words of the book of the law, the Bible then, that he rent his clothes. The Bible, the word of God, had, been, had reappeared right there and then and you can see that his first desire was that he looked as a young boy I want to spend money to make the house of God look good and he's done the right thing but he, within that house where there was no vision at the time was the Bible of that time the law and when that law came alive it, it brought the imagination of the heart of King Josiah alive First, he rents his clothes. He's in fear that he's standing before his God, realizing that what they've been doing is not quite right. And yet, Shaphan said, Oh, it's just a book. Yeah, you go, like if you imagine, oh, here, Pastor Paul found a book. And Pastor Paul reads it, and it's the Word of God. That's how rare the Word of God had been read at that time. But Josiah, now in the 18th year of his reign, he's 26 years of age just a young man and he wants to get it right with God a bit further down it says in verse 13 go inquire of the Lord because the anger of the Lord is against us and here the Lord replies verse 17 because they have forsaken me and burned incense and other gods that brought me to provoke me to anger with all the works of the hands therefore my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, which sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard, when you heard the word of God, because your heart was tender, and because you humbled yourself before the Lord, when thou heardest what I spoke against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse and has rent thy clothes and wept before me I also have heard thee saith the Lord and behold you'll be gathered together just verse 20 in, in peace I'm going to protect you King Josiah because you sought the Lord and you wanted to get it right with God and for all of us when the word of God appears in our life the first time that I uh, where the Bible had a, an impact I was on a train and there used to be this billboard at Brighton I am the way, the truth and the life I was going to work and 16 years old what does that mean? and then I was given a Bible where I didn't want anybody to know that I had it so on the side when I was hitchhiking down by on the, off the road in amongst the bushes and all that I had a torch and I'd try and read the Bible and every now and then you'd read something and it would come alive and then when you hear the word of God that we've all heard here today and for those that are um, looking to find the truth today the word of God will become your best friend there are times when one verse in the Bible you can be thinking about all day long has that happened to you? you get a verse and it sleeps out the page you can have a need in your life and someone quotes your scripture and it rolls around in your mind all day long you can wake up in the morning and think, I'm going to have a read of that verse. I haven't read that book. I haven't read for a while. You can wake up sometimes or a scripture can pop into your head at any given time of the day. And you can dwell and meditate. And it doesn't it make you feel good about yourself when you've got the word of God in your life? When you've gone from being a person searching to find the truth, such as King Josiah, to having it. And understanding it and the mercy that God showed him and then it goes on to say a little bit further that he wanted to do a, a Passover and it says well, just for time 
that there was not a greater Passover in all the history of Israel, not since right back of old to this day and a four that followed thereafter, than the Passover of that year. Because King Josiah had a vision. He had a mental picture of a nation clean, getting rid of all of its idols. And he got all the people, both small and great, important people, everybody. Next step, I want everybody of Israel to hear the Bible, the word of God. He, he arranged that. And it says that it came to pass that all of Israel would hear the word of God. From We found this book to a nation now cleaning up itself, getting rid of all its idols and all the bad things that had happened. And so much so that, you know, there's a picture here, it says, and King Josiah broke down the house of the Sodomites, which was next door to the house of God. So you want to look about the history of the Sodomites, it was next door to the house of God. That's how far removed they had become from what God wanted them to do. And here he is, cleaning it up, and then he just wants the people to first hear the Bible, to get enthused about just reading the Bible. I don't know about you, but when I don't read my Bible, I feel a little bit empty, a little bit dry, a little bit found wanting. But when I read my Bible, I just feel back in tune with God. And the Bible's there to help us. It's the light to our body. Equally, when something comes up, the first thing that happened with King Josiah, because he's so far distant in his vision and understanding with God, was that he just got on his, he was in fear of what God was going to do with him because of realizing how distant, how far away he was from having a good relationship with God. Go inquire for us. Go and find out what I've got to do. And the Lord saw the heart of Josiah. And Josiah, from that moment on, gets a vision for Israel to rule and reign and have this beautiful country back in a relationship with God. And it happened to pass, and no greater Passover in that time. Let's go forward, shall we, to Matthew in chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 4. Verse 18, it says, The path of the just is the shining light. The way of the wicked is darkness, and they know not what they stumble at. So we have a, with a vision, we have life, we have sight. And we're going to go to Matthew in chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And it says here in verse 22, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Jesus putting it to the people of the time. That here is the light, people that sat in darkness, it says in the a nation of the Gentiles, that Jesus was prophesied to come as the light to the people that sat in darkness. And it says from that day on, Jesus began to preach repentance and the kingdom of God is at hand. And he's saying here a little bit later that the light of the body is your eye, what we see, the vision that we actually see in our lives. And, and at a natural level, spiritual level, at a, at a psychological, emotional level, we need to be able to see a whole lot of things in our life. Um, to get us through the day, to get us through with our life. And we can have some hard times. And the thing that gets us through, as we heard with Merv and also with Jane, is the vision of understanding how the Word of God could be applied in, in their lives and how that they you know, get their victories. And that detail, that really good detail that Jane was saying about you know, the hands. And I've met people like that and know people. I know that with Christine over in England, just weeping hands, no matter what you did. Uh, it was just a horrible sight to look at another person going through, let alone what the person's going through. But the Lord came through and uh, healed, healed her at the time. So for all of us, having a vision, there's a guy by the name of Eric Weinmeier, born in 1968. He's in the, uh, honoured in the Time magazine in 2001. He climbs Mount Everest. And he, uh, the way he did it, 
It was honoured in the Time magazine of that particular May 25th uh, of that year, year 2000. So the previous year he was, he walked, climbed Mount Everest. And he wrote a book, No Barriers of Life. He spoke about what's within you is stronger than what is in your way. The scriptures tell us that too, which uh, greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. He climbs the seven highest peaks in the seven continents of the world. And he uh, has this amazing inspirational time. At four, he's told you've got a degenerative eye condition. At 14, he's totally blind. Never allowed to play sport, never allowed to do anything because if anything happened to his retina, he would, he'd lose his eyesight earlier. At 16, his 16th birthday, he's given a guide dog. And here he is in 1968, at the age of 32, born in 68, he climbs Mount Everest as a blind man. And he spoke about having a vision. I'll just quote him. People have inner resources to become anything they want to be. Challenge, challenge is just because challenge becomes the vehicle for tapping into the inner resources that we have as human beings. He's talking at a natural level. But it required a vision. It required a vision to go beyond what he could do in total blindness, and he, he made his way. When he arrived in Nepal to try and get a muster team together. They didn't believe that he could do it. They all said no. And then eventually he came across some Sherpas that would say, yeah, we'll do it. And they helped him all the way to the top of, of Mount Everest. And he became honoured in the Time magazine of that year. He says about things like, don't let unbelief impose low expectations in your life. I like that. And we've got to have a vision too. We do have a vision, all of us here today of climbing the spiritual Mount Everest, which is make it into the kingdom of God, because at times we do have to climb the mountain. It's not easy at times. We have to dig deep. And when we dig deep, we don't just find our natural uh, selves. We find God. The Holy Ghost is in us. And we get some amazing instructions and vision and understanding that we get from God to, to help us to keep going, to make it to the end, because we're his children, and he doesn't want to do anything bad. He said at 16, as a typical American way, he's an American guy, my dad would sweep me out of the world like a broom. Sweep me out so I'd get out. And I'd get beat up a little bit and shattered as my dad threw me out into the world. And mum would build me up again. She'd love me, care for me, tend to me, fix me up. And just as I'm feeling good to sit back in the couch, my dad would sweep me out again. And he said, that's a really good parent to do that. And how much more our spiritual father, he's our parent, how much more did he just prepares us to take on the mountains of life, the seven continents, the seven mountains, and just, you can do it. And we don't want you to concentrate on your disability. We don't want you to concentrate on what you're not, but more importantly, what you are and what you can be. And whatever you go through is to strengthen you. Why? Because I need you to go back into the world and save others. You need to go back. My dad would sweep me out. Mum would tend it to me. You ready, son? Bang. Out you go again. Just toughen up sort of thing. And he said, if it weren't for his dad doing that at 16, I wouldn't have survived. I wouldn't have done the, the, the big climb. So there's inspiration in that, in that natural level of just what God can do in people's lives. Let's go to John in chapter 1. John chapter 1. We can do it. We can all make it. And all the people said. What's their vision for our church? A thousand people. Is that possible? We settle for 400, 500, 600? Or do we have a vision for... A thousand. Does God prepare us, each and every one of us? All of us have got stories here today we could, like we heard here this afternoon from Merv and Jane that inspire. And there are people that have uh, dermatitis issues that need to hear that story that do, that will come to the Lord. 
uh, Merv, with his cancer and his um, being protected. Those are stories that we need to tell, share, and, and, the, and yours and mine. And we come to the church, we get looked after, we get tended to, and he wants to get us back out again. And that we don't want to become a snobby church. Look at us. How good are we? And those rotten people in the world. I don't want to be like that, do you? I want to be there to rescue them. And the only way that we can be rescued is that we've got to be stronger than the people that have got needs. When you're drowning, you get the, the, you know, the helicopter, the people that come out to help us. They're strong, they're, they're professionals, they're equipped, and they've got all the tools that are needed. And they rescue people out in the ocean. Some of the magnificent, horrendous storms that are out there in the ocean. And a, a guy in a helicopter will come along and get lowered down in this huge waves of, with no fear of his own life but just completely trusting of what he's been trained to do to rescue the people that are in, in need that have put out an, an SOS and we're the people that have got been trained we're the people that we can do all things through Christ which strengthens us we're the people that have climbed the mountain already but we've got more mountains to climb we're the people that have got the vision the understanding of what God can do in people's lives and when we hear stories about that we might be on a train and, with, and people open up to us about their lives or at work the first thing that comes to our mind doesn't it is that wow imagine what God can do in your life it's a vision that we have for people who sit in darkness just as Jesus said people that sat in darkness he came to them as a light and we got here in John in the beginning was the word verse 1 the word was with God and the word was God the same in the beginning with God all things were made by him and without him not anything was made in him was life and life was the light of men the light shineth in darkness and darkness comprehended it not and there was a man sent from God his name was John the same to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Jesus came to shine light onto to a darkened world. If ever you felt like alone, the scriptures say there was none righteous, no, not one. All had sinned and come short of the glory of God. That word glory, every one of us felt uncovered and, and naked. And we, we had a time in the Garden of Eden when we were naked and not ashamed we had the glory of God we walked and talked with God in the cool of the evening and it says that all the food was pleasant to view to, to have and it was all good and there was nothing amiss everything was good 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 fantastic and then Eve came along and she saw the same thing food that was pleasant to the eye as Adam had seen food that was pleasant to the eye she saw that it was good God said that was good the same words are described but she partakes of the tree of good and evil. And from that moment on, the fall of man is where we are today. We're in the tree of life. We've been baptized with spirit filled. We can partake of the fruit of what God's offering us. And we can see from the world what's happening is that people are taking the fruit of good and of evil. That's why there is good people out there and there are bad people. And we have a duty now to go to them and say, hey, we've got an answer for you. We can help you not to look down on them but to actually rescue and to save and to deliver and through that our vision will go from where we are now to a thousand people can you imagine a thousand maybe a hall further down south of a thousand people is that possible because that's a vision that we have to have in ourselves that we're a church that holds the truth the word of god valuable we're the king josiahs of our generation well, we want to show to people the error through the God as one point, but not, not there as a full stop, but to get, get to the real issue, which is to tell people how they can have a relationship with God and to be healed and to be set free and to be delivered and to find peace with God and to walk in this life knowing that you're going to go to heaven. That's our main objective. And to show to people that they can have something. As, as uh, this young man, Eric, blinded, can't see anything, but he said, I saw the mountain, I saw the peak, I saw the colours. Because remember, there's a 14-year-old boy. 
and he knew how tough it was and the friends around him he had to rely upon people around him to get to the very top so he made it and he made it well and that's part of his his life let's go to um first john in chapter four epistle of john in chapter four i think i quoted this but we'll read it first john chapter four About all the stories that we've been hearing in the Zoom last night from the UK, different ones around there, Fiji in India, how he came to the Lord. He was witnessed to by a guy from Singapore. It's his last hurrah, if you like. And he was just overwhelmed how the Lord put them together and how the Word of God came to his life. And now Fiji is doing a little bit more in uh, India at the moment. From one person witnessing to him, we got to our... Um, um, what's not Richard? What are we say in China? Shutan. Shutan, 237. I didn't know that. 237 baptisms has been in China since he's been back. 2012. You know Shutan, remember? That's uh, I think um, Sean and Sally invited them when they were hitching when he was hitchhiking around. They get gave, gave me a meal, a bit of dinner. And from that, 237 people around China baptised and filled with the Holy Ghost. One person, you and I in this room. It's a thousand people. That's our vision. We need to have a vision. We need to believe that we are set up for the Flurio from Darlington all the way down and um, people that have come to the Lord here, Shutan over in China, here and different ones and, and some of the contacts we have around the world. A lot of people come to the Lord through Adelaide. So the Lord has set us up and we've been through some tough times. We've had people that have been very near and dear to us that have passed away and fallen asleep. Some have been very shocking and sudden and it just takes the wind out of our sail. It can uh, lose our confidence about healing. I think at some point in time there's a bit of a, um, not a, a, a misstep, but there were so many people were sick and healing was beginning to um, not put anybody under condemnation because people were dying. We've gone through that. We've worked our way through that. We believe in healing. We believe in miracles. But our church as a whole has been through some tough times. There are people that are trying to make their way back into the fellowship. We've got to find a road for them to come back. That's right to do. That is very right to do. And each individual should have a right that we would help them because they've come from the world, they're blinded by the world, they're blinded in their, in their situation, they haven't got a relationship with God as well that we have. We know our Bibles and we've got to find a way without compromise to bring them back into the kingdom of God. That's our duty that we would do that, to find a way for people to come back into the kingdom of God and to help them and save them. And, and, and that way our church is a beacon for the world. And John here it says, John chapter 4, Verse 4, year of God, little children. He sweeps us out, get out, do your job, sort of thing. Toughen you up. Dad didn't want me to, be, quote, Dad did not want me to live my life concentrating on my disabilities. That's his saying. So Dad would sweep me out. I'd get beat up from the world. And Mum would look after me. You have, little children, you have God, little children, have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. How great is our God is inside of us as we walk with the Lord. Let's go to Philippians in chapter 4. Just nearly finished. And then there's another guy, Fred Hollows, eye specialist. Yeah, Fred Hollow's um, foundation. He passed away in 1993. Two Aboriginals, elders, came to him in his clinic in uh, the early 70s, and they were both blind. A trachoma disease, so uh, like a um, what do they call it, a, um, a bacteria, junctivitis, left untreated, leads to blindness. Some of the poorer 
communities in our country. Two men. And he had an inspiration. He had what he called an unstoppable vision. Now, 60,000 Aboriginals have got their eyesight back because he believed, whether you're dealing with a pauper, a king, an eye is an eye. Not an eye for an eye, he said, an eye for an eye. Fix up people's eyesight to give them something. That's a vision. To date, two and a half million people around the world have benefited from his vision that he had. He um, first got to climb Mount Everest. Um, Sir Edmund Hillary and him were from the same alpine uh, hiking club in, in uh, New Zealand. Sir Edmund Hillary met him before he went up to Mount Everest in 1951. He saw a very keen young man. And then Sir Edmund Hillary climbs Mount Everest in 1968 when the young Eric Mann was born. Same year, 1968, Fred Hollows decides he wants to help people. Um, his inspiration, Sir Edmund Hillary. 2000, in the year 2000, when Eric Von Maho climbs Mount Everest as a blind man, first ever do that, his inspiration, Sir Edmund Hillary. Um, Fred Hollows wants to go around and help people receive their sight. His friend, Sir Edmund Hillary, there. Sir Edmund Hillary goes to Nepal, sees all the blind Nepalese. Later in life, they reconvene as friends. Fred Hollows decides to build a factory in Nepal to make cheaper uh, lenses for people with cataracts. And from one or two flashes of inspiration, how that they've all come together, and time has not dimmed the motivation. King Josiah had motivated a whole nation to do what you can do. Jesus came to this world as a lonely one man. He was not in fellowship with anybody. There was none righteous. No, not when he came to his own and his own received them. He was a very lonely figure. But he had a vision of you and I making it with God. He had a vision. And we looked at a couple of natural things at Ferret Hallows there when he made it, his vision. He said, we discover our own humanity when we help others. And when we help each other out in the fellowship, we, we don't just discover humanity, we discover the power of the Holy Ghost working in our life and what God can do in people's lives. He went on to say, the bravest are people who have a clear vision of what is before them, glory and danger alike, but notwithstanding, onward they go and they meet their challenge. That was things that they've said in their, in their lives. Now they've all, some have passed away. But we have togetherness. We've got a vision for the future. Let's aim for a thousand people. Let's aim to, to do our little bit. That each and every one of us may have some disability, no, an imperfection. I wish I could be better at this. I wish I could look like this. But God wants to say, I'm going to beat you up a bit. Get up there. Come back to the church. We'll, we'll lick the wounds together. When you feel good about yourself, back out you go. Save some souls and you'll feel good about that. And it says in Philippians in chapter 4, I can do all things. I'm going to almost quote it. Hang on. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. It's not a motivational pitch today it's, it's a reality that we are best selves when we're giving we are best when we're reminding and we've got a vision that whatever we go through is for our strengthening so we can reach the mountain top of life and that we can go out and help people out in the world and today for those that want to make it with God baptism tank prayer room is here for you today We'll, I'll get off the stage so we can have a communion stage and then you can get baptised. And all the people said, Amen. Amen.